Uh, welcome to our producer case studies um, for across the northwest. Today uh, I'm talking to Alistair Donaldson here at Willala about the strategies that he has implemented to, um, to cope with and, and adapt to the recent drought. Um, so there's some really great learnings here in what Alistair has done with cutting silage and storing it and then utilising it when he needed it. So Alistair, what initiated um, the idea to produce silage here back in um, 2007 it was? Yeah, so we'd, as part of a family business, previous family business, we'd, we'd, done, we'd had a number of attempts at silage before. Um, actually a fine chop uh, in pits, uh, mostly below ground level pits, type of pits. So we happened upon the idea of uh, big block silage, so six by three by four. Uh, via a big square baler, um, for possibly for the ease of handling, um, loading of it, um, the fact that it can be done easily by a contractor, uh, no, not in, no real specialist machinery uh, per se, other than your standard haymaking kit. Um, yeah, and um, philosophically, just a, a long-term insurance policy for the future. Yeah, so what was the crop that you used for the silage? Uh, it was a 52 hectare crop of uh, triticale. Um, yeah, so, and um, cut at milky dough stage. Uh, it was pretty much grown specifically for the purposes of filling this pit. And what were sort of the, the extra things you did to that crop to um, in, in light of the fact that it was going into for silage? Uh, just, just normal agronomy, I think. Just, just uh, addressing plant nutrition. Um, I guess with withholding periods, you wouldn't want to have any any you know major herbicides, fungicides over it that would um, detract from your you know that with whole withholding period type um, situation. So just normal agronomy. Okay. Basically. Okay. So it was um, it was cut and um, and baled mm. into uh, so the the bales you were saying in terms of the size and the yeah, weight six, of them. Six by three by four, eight hundred and thirty kilos. So. Um, to go to an eight by three by four would have possibly been a, an extremely heavy op, um, um, product and possibly ungainly. So we kept them fairly fairly short, six by three by four. Uh, the, the pit itself is um, around about uh, 20, uh, 20 feet wide, I suppose, in the old, old terms. So we've got a small area on the sides of the pits to run the plastic down to ground level or down to floor level. Um, yeah, it's 70 metres 70 meters deep, uh, as in up into the hillside. Built, um, It's got full proper drainage, so we've got a fall from the top of the pit to the opening of the pit. There could be something like, I'm only estimating, but I'd be thinking something in the order of at least 50, 50 centimetres of drainage. Uh, that way you've, you've got a, a certain amount of effluent drainage. Um, and also, in the event that you do have a rainfall event as you're unloading it, you don't end up with a quagmire. So it's, it's, it's all self-draining for the purposes of unloading it. Okay, so, uh, so how did you actually fill the, the pit with the bales? Um, so yeah, it's just uh, initially just uh, trucks positioned down the bottom here and um, thereafter, uh, initially a 70 metre run up to, the, to start stacking on the far end, uh, three wide and four high so each face was 12 bales i mean there's opportunities for other people to larger or smaller i would suggest but that's just what suited us at the time right right and so when it um when you actually opened the the pit which was in um 2018 yes what was the what were the triggers what uh, you'd put this this down it had been down 11 years what happened in 2018 that that led you to needing to um access the pit well, essentially drought, I guess. Um, we still had hay in storage, but we could see a long winter ahead of us. We were carving at the time. So we thought, well, if we're going to open it, we probably want to finish the pit. I mean, there is opportunities to reclose it again, but perhaps, um, yeah, we just said, well, we've got a big need for it now. We don't have to utilise all our hay storage, so we're going to go for it. And we kept away at the pit, working away at the pit and uh, feeding most things on the farm until it was done. So. I think we got about three months feed out of it. Yeah, so having access to this meant that you were able to maintain your, your ground covers and, and protect your, your existing pastures yep. um, and, and preserve then that long term uh, and ease of recovery when it, when it did. Yeah, yeah, well just to touch on feeding out, it was literally um, shoveled off the back of a truck, 
pitchforked off the back of a truck onto confined feeding paddocks, um, spoilage and um, from from feeding on the ground was minimal, um, but we did uh, experience a, a certain amount of spoilage from uh, excessive effluent, particularly in the bottom bottom area of the pit. So that's that's there's one design feature that we definitely need to do now that in the future uh, to remedy that problem. The further up the pit you went, the less spoilage there was because there was a line of line of effluent and we excessively plugged it unfortunately at the bottom so backfilling with dirt that means that the effluent wasn't able to get away so it just stayed in here um, in future we'll be a little bit more particular about the gradient and make sure that we don't over plug it at the end or and or possibly use like a, a small like a 150 100 mil sewerage main at the bottom and possibly even a, like a, an air trap, an airlock, S-Bend type kind of situation. Okay, so in terms of the cost, um, there's the cost to actually grow the crop which would be the normal sort of expense. Um, the cost of construction of the, um, the pit, what sort of figures would you be looking at there Alistair? Going back to 2007, I can't really quite remember all of that, uh, but eff effectively it's a matter of marking out the pit with an X, uh, you, you know, the 20 feet wide, um, cutting, cutting vertical with an excavator, so breaking it out by cutting your lines with your excavator and then from the side of the pit you'd bulk it out, bulk out with the excavator so you've got these nice sheer walls. Mm. Okay, and, okay. And, um, yeah. Uh, then the process, I'll just continue with the process thereafter, so once the pit was full or ongoing we'd be sheeting it with plastic and just putting a little bit of dirt on top just to hold it, um, just to hold the plastic in place until such times as the pit was finished and then we backfilled the whole lot with around about 18, uh, 18 inches of um, fill. Okay, okay. So the um, the stock that you were feeding out for these were cows and cows and cows calves. And calves yes. Yeah. So how so how many for how for how many for how long? Probably 180 to 200 cows, calving cows for around about three months, I think, just off memory, from memory. So it it did definitely fill the hole. There's no doubt about that. Excuse the pun. Yeah. So no. So certainly, yeah. The value, yeah. Certainly, an amazing value of that product, yeah. and that, and the, also the ability to access it when you needed it. Yeah. To, absolutely. So you could yeah. almost hard to put a, a put a value on that. Um, well, it's it like any fodder conservation. It is an expensive process unless you're using a byproduct, as in stubble, fail crops. Uh, the, the big role for this pit in the future will be in the event of uh, like a major frosting scenario in existing in our cropping country. So we got durum this year, we got barley, everything's coming in fairly early so if there was a major frost in the event we'd, we'd want to identify it early and then work out what we're going to do in that regard and then go for it. Yeah, yeah so it's certainly something that you will now, you'll continue to use, you'll you'll look at the opportunity to refill. Yes, yeah, I mean it, the pit's collapsing in a few places, it's just a bit of a matter of maintenance, but it's essentially the bones are still there, you can still see the, the, you know, the sheer sidewalls. If you can put it into a very stable soil type that's not going to collapse, um, hopefully there's no groundwater running through it. There could have been a hint of groundwater actually in a wet time running through this, because we'd start to see a little bit of extra effluent come off it. In, in wet times, so there might have been some ingress into the pit with groundwater, but yeah, good, good sloping site, dry, um, yeah, good stable soil type. The um, site is fenced out, so just to keep the livestock off the top of it, and then once the pit's down, just ongoing maintenance, making sure there's no holes where the where the fills where the backfill subsided. So you, there's on, on, over two or three occasions over those three to four years, uh, those eight years that it was down, we um, just came back in and backfilled it a little bit in just basic maintenance, making sure there's there's limited capacity for air to make it way, its way through to the through to the uh, through to the product. So Alistair, yeah, it's a great uh, resource, um, an asset you had here. I guess um, maintenance or um, any sort of um, issues that you um, in, in, encountered that uh, are really important lessons to be learnt for you guys doing it again or other producers considering um, having a silage pit like this? Obviously pit construction is incredibly important um, 
we need this good soft gentle grade heading towards the outlet of the pit um, and in the future we will definitely be looking towards some sort of drainage mechanism to make sure that we don't get any build up of excessive uh, effluent. I mean if you're, if you're very close to a you know, a stream system, I don't think it's advisable that that effluent makes its way into into water systems, but in a dryish landscape like this, I don't think it's a particular problem. Um, my brother had uh, some some pits that really didn't have any drainage whatsoever, and he ended up pretty much losing the lot. Um, so, if the dry, if it's not allowed, if it's not able to drain in this particular pit, we possibly lost around about thirty percent of the of the lower levels, particularly towards the bottom of the pit. And what was the main uh, spoilage? Is it is it uh, mould or is it just becoming? No, it's just it was just it was just waterlogged, like uh, just sat in like a pickle type thing. Whereas the towards the top of the silage, the, to, the dry sections towards the top of the, of the silage pit was more. In some places, it was more like haylage. It was beautiful quality. Um, obviously, we didn't have any plastic on the floor. It was just sitting on on the dirt. That wasn't a, so much of an issue. It was just the fact that the the effluent was built up quite significantly, particularly towards the bottom of the pit. So where we're standing now, sort of only a quarter of the way up the pit, the effluent le level would have been at least knee height here, and sort of anything underneath that level was lost. So, so Alistair, yeah, back in um, 2007, that was really forward thinking and, and planning to uh, to look at, at cutting that silage and storing it. It's um, it's you know, certainly, you know, I guess it's a credit to you and, and your, your enterprise here to, um, to be preparing yourselves for these um, potentially dry conditions and I guess they, they may continue into the future so you'd certainly um, would look to, to, to do this. Um, do, you, do you think that this sort of type of uh, storage really does have a place um, and that producers in the northwest should be, should be thinking about uh, doing something similar? Yeah, for sure. In, in the same way that a lot of producers actually put low quality, low value grain in the ground, uh, that's another good way of storing uh, long term storage. And you hear a lot of that sort of thing happening. This is the same, if you, if, particularly if you've got an opportunity crop, just an excess of, of material that you can't store in your hay sheds, or if you've got a frosted crop, or you know something along those lines. Uh, it's just a good opportunity to take advantage of that and then and then sort of plan for the future. We, we used to call this the doomsday pit. We sort of, it had to be a particularly difficult situation, which we've just been through, um, and in which we would open the dooms, doomsday pit. So, yep, yep. Unfortunately, the doomsday went on about 15 months after that. <laughs> Way too long. <laughs> No, well, look, uh, look, well done, and, and thank you, Alistair, um, for your time today because it's it's you helping um, sharing your knowledge um, with the producers across the northwest to uh, to extend out you know what's worked well and, and what hasn't, and uh, yeah, we really want to sort of showcase some of these um, uh, strategies that um, landholders have used um, in preparation for and throughout the throughout the drought. To, um, to maintain their, their productivity and uh, sustainability. So uh, thanks for your time today, Alistair. Much appreciated. No worries, George.